Good morning. Happy uh, last day of March, which seems kind of crazy, right? That tomorrow is April. That's wild. Uh, it's April Fools, by the way. So be on the lookout for that. Husbands, if your wives tells you that she's pregnant, you can probably laugh it off, right? <laughs> I have four kids, so that joke's never okay in my house. <laughs> never okay. Um, but uh, with it, April kind of being tomorrow, I mean, we're kind of, we're, we're approaching Easter. And so we started a new series uh, called Follower. And, and so we're gonna uh, kind of move our way. This is gonna take us into Easter where we're looking at uh, just some stories uh, of people as they interact with Jesus. And there's this, this grappling and this tension with what it means to, to follow him and who he really is. And so we're gonna dive into some of those uh, stories. Um, but one of, the, one of the pleasures that, that I have uh, just being a pastor here on staff is I get to, I get to meet with people a lot one-on-one. -on -one. I get to, uh, to have conversations with people um, for the first time. And so, so as I get to know people, I kind of have some go-to questions that I initially throw out there um, just to ask. And so one of the first questions is um, like, what kind of, of shows do you watch? Uh, what kind of podcasts do you subscribe to? And, and what kind of books do you read? <clears throat> And I ask those for, for a specific reason, like movies, movies have gone kind of big banner, if you've noticed, like movies um, are, are made in such a way now where uh, the effort is to try to get as many people to watch them as possible. And so they're, they're made in that way. They're made to be kind of massly consumed and massly watched, right, by a huge, huge audience, diverse audience. Uh, shows and podcasts kind of go the opposite direction, right? They kind of go and dive down into these like really, really deep segmented cultures of people and, and topics, right? So you've got shows about people who are renovating houses. You've got shows about people who are hunting houses. You've got shows about people who are literally just hunting. Uh, you have shows about rednecks and shows about housewives and shows about redneck housewives. And you've got all these, you got shows about hoarding, which when I reach, when I meet the people who watch the hoarding shows, I like, I don't know where to go from there. It's just kind of like, we're kind of stuck like what's, I don't know what's next. I don't know how to move past that, but um, podcasts the same way. I mean, there's, there's podcasts about finances, every level of finance, every level of leadership. There's, there's podcasts about every kind of sport, fantasy sports. There's podcasts about serial killers. I mean, there's any, any, any kind of way you go, there's, there's, there's something for you, right? Uh, and same way with books. So I ask those kind of questions because it really kind of, it uncovers something, right? Because to, you've got you've to really like go down deep and, and that, that says something about you when you subscribe to something like that or you follow something like that. Because here's what it says. You've chosen that one thing above a lot of other things, a lot of other options, right? Above all the other noise and all the other options that you could have cho chosen from, you chose that thing. And so it says something that when you subscribe to that thing or when you follow that thing or that person, you're saying that I value this thing above all the other things. I value what this person is saying above what is being said by anyone else. And it, it, kind, of, it kind of gives me a sense of, of, of who you are. 
um, that this thing stands above for some reason. We do this in relationships too. It's, it's, how, it's how we come to get married, right? That the process of, of marrying someone starts with like a, a distant admiration, right? I, I, my marriage wasn't arranged. I'm assuming yours wasn't either, right? So I'm assuming that you kind of saw your spouse from afar and, and you, you had some admiration. There's something about that person that you liked that drew, that drew you to them. And then the process began, hopefully not a really creepy way of you kind of working closer to them, right? And, and establishing a relationship and establishing a, a sense of, of getting to, to know them. And then there comes a moment where you pick that person above all the rest, where you communicate, like, I value you above anyone else that's out there. And I pick you above all the other options. Like I pick you, right? So we even, we even see that in our relationships. There's something about that moment, that moment that says, I want to be with you, right? And there's certainly a, a spiritual tie here, right? Because spiritually, this is the call for us as well, that Jesus, Jesus has many, many admirers. Jesus has many admirers. He has many people who would look at him from a distance and say, yeah, I like that Jesus guy, right? Jesus is respected like in, in most cultures, like most cultures respect Jesus. Like even in Islam, Jesus is a prophet. He is a prophet who had some power. Um, he is a guy who was, who was well liked and well respected in that religion. Mahatma Gandhi said um, about the Sermon on the Mount, he said that Jesus' very famous sermon, Sermon on the Mount, um, is one of the greatest liter literary things given to mankind, human beings. It's one of the greatest things ever, ever written and ever given to humanity, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And he said that if, if Christians actually lived it out and followed it, he said there would be no other religions that would exist in India. They wouldn't exist. Christianity would be the only thing that's there. Even in our culture, that's, that's, that, that's gone, that's trending more secular, right? Even in our culture, like Jesus is still respected. Like the, the idea of, of church, um, Jesus' followers, Christianity, all those things might not be as much. But people still in our culture look at Jesus and look at his life and look at what he says. And they, and they, and they say, yeah, there's some value there. There's some value there. The idea of loving your neighbor and living sacrificially and the idea of the golden rule, right? That Jesus says later on in the Sermon on the Mount, that do unto others as you would have done unto you. Pretty much everyone on earth can get on board with that. Everyone in our culture can get on board with that. And so Jesus has lots of people that look at him from a distance and say, yeah, that guy's okay, right? But as we read through the gospels, as we read about these stories with people interacting with Jesus, we see people brought to the reality of God's claims, the reality of Jesus' claims about who he is. And they're brought to this point, this decision where, okay, now like I have to follow him or not. That looking him at, at this distance and, and seeing and admiring him from afar and respecting who he is and respecting the things that he says, that, that, that doesn't really jive very well or for very long with those who are walking and talking with Jesus. They're brought to this moment. And you and I are brought to this moment. We're brought to this moment where we no longer sort of ask ourselves, do I admire him or not? We're asked, do I follow him or not? Or, or do I appreciate what he might do for us and for our families and for our culture? We're asked to move beyond that. Do we, do we pick him above all others? As we, as we see people interacting with Jesus, we see people who are brought to this very singular moment and we see the conversations that they have. And so we're gonna look at two stories today that we find in the gospel of John where we have individuals coming to this moment with Jesus and we see how it unfolds. Um, so the first is in John chapter three. If you have your Bibles, you can uh, flip over there. And we find uh, the story of a man named Nicodemus. <clears throat> And so I'm just going to read the, the whole, the whole uh, exchange that he has with him, or most of the exchange. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, no one is born again if Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, 
and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him and said, are you the teacher of Israel and yet do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say unto you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. And if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So we're introduced to this guy named Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus is a Pharisee. So he is part of a uh, kind of a ruling religious class um, of the people of Israel. And he comes to him at night and he comes to him at night because um, a person like that, like him with his status, meeting with Jesus during the daytime would have brought some unwanted attention and would have brought some unwanted questions. It would have meant that uh, Nicodemus would have to answer to his peers, like, why are you interacting with this guy who we very clearly do not like? And so Nicodemus comes to him at night in secret. Um, and Nicodemus is really, he, he really is a, a, a representative of a, of a greater culture and a greater group. He's part of a culture um, who believes um, that they have established in their mind already a built framework of what it means to know God, about what it means to interact with God, about the difference between how to rightly engage with God and not rightly engage with God, a framework about who is, who is bad and who is good, uh, a framework about how to go about living life. So Nicodemus represents this, really this entire culture and this entire people. But he admires Jesus. It says that, that he looks at Jesus and he says, like, it's very clear that God is with you. Because if God wasn't with you, you would not be able to do what you are doing. And so Nicodemus from afar has been admiring Jesus and saying that there's something about him that's interesting, that God has clearly has his hand in some way, shape or form on Nicodemus. Um, and so Jesus uh, begins to interact with Nicodemus and, and begins to, to talk in such a way where Nicodemus does not understand. He looks at Nicodemus and says, if you wanna enter the kingdom of God or you wanna be a part of, of what I'm doing, you must be born again. And that born again literally means to be remade literally from top to bottom, to be completely made whole. So Nicodemus kind of responds kind of sarcastically. He's like, okay, well, I'm old. Like how, how can I be reborn? It's either sarcastic or it's kind of wistful. He's actually asking like, is that even possible? Is it even possible that I can be remade, that God can make me new? Um, but Nicodemus has this framework in his mind and the words that Jesus are using, they, they don't seem to compute, right? Because what Jesus is asking him to do is look at life in a way that Nicodemus has never looked at life before. He's literally asking Nicodemus to humble himself, to think about what this might mean. And Jesus' response to Nicodemus is really key because Nicodemus hears the analogy that Jesus gives about water and spirit and he can't really figure it out. And, and Jesus says something really important to him that I think you and I can benefit from. He says, look, if you, if you don't understand things that are on earth, if you don't understand the earthly things that I'm talking to you about, then the analogies that I use and the words that I say and the way that I say them, those things are heavenly. And if you don't understand the earthly things that I'm saying, you can't possibly understand the heavenly things. And, and this is true for you and I, it's an important point to make and it's our first point. Usually when you interact with Jesus, here's what usually happens. At some point in time, Jesus is going to confront the incompleteness of you in your following him. But he's gonna provide a better way. So Jesus very pointedly with Nicodemus confronts Nicodemus's incompleteness or what's gonna be, what's gonna be missing for him to really follow him. But he doesn't dismiss Nicodemus. He doesn't say, okay, you're a teacher. You're supposed to figure this out already. Now go, go away because you can't get it. He actually offers him the truth. Are you open to my work? But his message to him is, is you have to understand some of the foundational things first. And that's gonna, that's gonna be re reorient your mind a little bit. You have to be willing to change the way you've been thinking about me and thinking about what it means to follow me. Look, and there are certain things in our lives, right? That, that, that even, they might seem very, very small. That, that if you take them away though, it changes everything. There are things in our lives that, that we think are small, but if taken away or if removed, it literally, nothing else can be built upon it. I have this memory of, of, of my high school teacher and this was in home ec. I think I was like the last 
like class of students to ever take home ec. I don't think they offer home ec anymore, right? Most of the home ec teachers are like 85 year old ladies. And so maybe that's why they're just, they're gone. I don't know. Um, but I was, the, I was, I feel like my, my home ec teacher was like the last, I was the last group to take home ec. And I have this image of her in my brain and she was the sweetest lady. Now you'll get why I have this image in my brain burned in there. Um, but we had these group projects in which we were to make something or bake something. Um, and then the entire class had to eat it. Everyone had to eat it, right? Which seems like a bad idea because if something goes terribly wrong, like, and there's poison involved, everyone in there is just dead, right? And no one knows what happened. It's like, let's pick one person. One person can, can not eat it. That way, if we all die, someone can at least tell the story of what happened, right? But she was a, I mean, the sweetest lady, sweetest lady. She was the kind of like the, the, the perfect image of my head of, a, of like a sweet grandmother who like, no matter what her grandkids did, even if they're terrible, like she still has very positive, nice things to say, right? This is who she was with all of her students. And so I was working with this group and unfortunately young teenage boys are dumb, right? It's an unfortunate thing, but they are. And I was a part of that. And so um, it turns out, so we were making chocolate chip cookies, like the easiest thing that you can make, right? And it turns out that like, for some reason you put salt in chocolate chip cookies, right? And it turns out that if you swap the quantity of salt and sugar, it makes the cookie taste way worse. <laughs> and so uh, the image that I have of, of this teacher, this sweet teacher in my brain is her like kind of like trying to still smile, but trying to, 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 to knock down this cookie, to eat this cookie and the face that she's making, that's the face that's burned into my brain. It's like, she's like dying inside. Like she can't, she can't do it. Like, and everyone, everyone around the room is just like, they're like almost puking. Like they're spitting this thing out. Cause it's awful. Right. Cause it turns out that like something very, very small, like a small switch, even ingredients that look the same, right. They look the same. You have to like actually taste them to know the difference between them. Right. They look identical. But a small mistake actually turns out it can actually make something taste that's usually really, really good taste terrible. And, and, and in our relationships, we see this too. There, there are some things in our relationships that, that are so small, that seems so small, that if they're taken away or if they're incomplete or if they're fractured and broken, it's really, really hard to build anything else on top of it. I mean, even, even just like talking to your spouse, being able to ask your spouse for something, being able to communicate um, that you're upset about something or that something bothers you or that something irritates you, being able to communicate that in a way that isn't spiteful or resentful or, you know, or filled with you know, malice or, or to, to do that well takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of effort. And if you take that away, if you take those kind of communication things away, like it, it literally changes everything. Everything becomes immensely more difficult. And Steve just spent a month about talking about this, but it's true. It's one of those things that communication is one of those things that it's so, it seems so small. It seems so small and insignificant, but if you remove it, man, it's like nothing else can be built on top of this thing. And, and this was Jesus's message to Nicodemus. He, he's pointing out that you have these things you have this framework in your mind that you've built about what it means to interact with God and you're missing these very foundational things. And because you're missing these very foundational things, nothing else can really be built. Look, and there are things inside of all of us, right? There are things inside of all of us that when we're presented with the gospel, um, we're brought to this point where we're, what, what we hold back or the things that are missing are very evident, that Jesus makes them evident. That the longer we walk with Jesus, the more these things become clear. And we're brought to this position where it's like, okay, I'm at this point and now I have to make a choice. It's like, I either reject Jesus and what he's saying, or I accept him. Like Jesus has this ability throughout all the New Testament to necessitate, necessitate a reaction from us, right? That we are brought to this position of, we have to choose, right? And we see this throughout the gospels. Jesus points out, he says, this one thing you lack. You've got a lot of other good things, but this one thing you lack. And that individual uh, is brought to this position where it's like, okay, I, I, I'm stuck here. I can't, I can't just be meh about Jesus, right? Jesus removes that, removes that from us. That we can admire him from a distance, but the minute we begin to follow him is the minute that sometimes he exposes things in us and we're brought to this point of choosing. And, and maybe it's our, our trust in the wrong thing. 
Maybe it's, it's our worship or the elevation of, of another thing that isn't Jesus, that we've actually, we've actually not said, okay, Jesus, I value you above all other things. Maybe there's something else that we would say that about. Maybe it's just the, the, the idea of, of I can't really move past just admiring you, that actually accepting you and bringing you in and following you uh, brings me to a place that I'm not ready to go yet. Jesus sort of forces us into that conversation. But he gives us a chance to, to do something greater. The invitation is always greater. Something greater is awaiting if we can move past this thing. And so if we, if we spend enough time with Jesus, we're, we're going to be pointed out that just our, our, just our admiration alone is really insufficient. It's insufficient. And so we move to this other story. This other story is in John 6, a few chapters later. And just some context here, because context here is important about what happens before this story. <clears throat> Jesus has just fed the 5,000, right? And, um, and so he does this miracle and the crowd, seeing the miracle that has been done, immediately wants to make him king which is pretty significant because Rome is the occupier and to make a king, there is no other king but Caesar. And so to make Jesus king meant that they were like, we're willing, we're willing to, to fight. We're willing to, to go to war about this. And so Jesus kind of sensing that that's what they were planning on doing. It says that he kind of slips away and he is, and his disciples go to the other side of the Sea of Capernaum where he very famously walks on, on water. And the crowd um, later on, realizing that Jesus is gone, they can't find him, they don't know where he is. They go to the other side of the sea as well and finally meet up with him. And then Jesus begins to have this conversation with this large crowd of followers. And it's in verse 25, it says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered, truly I say to you, you are seeking me not because you just saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. And they said to him, what must we do to be doing the good works of God? And Jesus answered them. He said, this is the, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. And so they said to him, then what sign do you do? that we may believe and see and believe you. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. And as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so I'm gonna skip over some of these parts and kind of fill in the gaps here, but here's what's happened. So, so he begins to interact with the crowd, his followers, and he begins to point out the reasons in which they were following him, right? He first says, first you saw signs. Right, but that's not really the reason. The other reason, the full reason why you were following me, that's part of it. You saw the signs that I was doing, but also you had food, right? Which as I think about that, I get it. Like if someone had the ability to just like pull Chick-fil-A sandwiches out of their pockets endlessly, I'm following that guy around too, right? <laughs> Wherever you go, I'm going, man, because food's there, right? So I get that part. But then he begins to talk about who he was and, and what they should do and how they might do the good works of God? That's a good question they asked. How might we be doing the good works of God? That's a good question. We ask that question too, hopefully at some point in our lives. Like, what does it mean to follow God? What does it mean to do what he asks? And so Jesus says, believe on him who sent me. And then the response is kind of weird. They're like, okay, we want you to do a sign then. Like our, like our forefathers, like Moses. Moses gave us manna from heaven. And so Jesus points out to them, well, okay, well, it actually wasn't Moses who gave you the bread. It was God himself who gave you the bread. And then he says this in verse 35. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the father gives to me will come to me. And whosoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but of the will of him who sent me. And so immediately the crowd begins to kind of grumble because Jesus told them that I've come down from heaven. And the response is, is like, that like Jesus, we, we know who your parents are. Like we know your uncle Phil, we know him. Like he's got a gambling problem. Like so this idea that you came from heaven and we know who your parents are is kind of weird, right? And Jesus reiterates, he, he, he moves past their questioning and he gives them the analogy again in verse 51. He says, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. 
If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. So he takes it a step further. He says, I am the bread of life. And he goes on and says, my flesh is the bread of life. It is what will be sacrificed for the world. And again, they're given this analogy in the same way that Nicodemus was, that they didn't understand. And Jesus in the next few verses will take it a step further. He'll say, if you don't eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And all of a sudden they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like this has gone from weird level one to like weird level 10, right? This is very, very weird. What you're saying is very disturbing. Even Jesus' disciples are like, this seems odd. Like, why are we talking about this? You see, but Jesus is doing the exact same thing that he did with Nicodemus. He's giving them an analogy that has so much greater meaning. And he's, he's challenging their frameworks about what, what it means to follow God and, and what they're willing to do and, and, and what he is actually about doing. And he's, he's unveiling for them the problems that, are, that exist in their minds that make him, make them, it makes them impossible to see beyond what he's really trying to say. He's trying to give them a greater message, but what they've built in their minds about who God is, is preventing that message from being communicated. And we see in verse 66, the response of that. It says, and after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And I think about the crowd here and I think about all that they had witnessed and all the things they had seen. And it's, it's really difficult for me to, to, want to, to, to see and to come to the place where how do you make those decisions? How do you make those statements if you're the crowd after seeing all that Jesus had done and getting hung up on the semantics of Jesus's language? It seems so odd after, after literally being handed Chick-fil-A sandwiches endlessly out of this man's pockets, right? It's like, how do you then turn and ask for another sign that doesn't seem to compute, doesn't seem to make sense? But these events for these people, they were, they, it was an opportunity for them. The signs and the things that Jesus was saying to move them across the spectrum of following and to a deeper level of following. And you and I have the same thing, right? And this is the, the, last, the second point for you. All, all of us, all of us, we have opportunities and events that move us up, across the spectrum of following. To move us to a deeper level of following or a deeper level of understanding of who God is and what he's doing in our lives. All of us do. The question for us is, is will, we, will we acknowledge it and will we sense it and will we believe that this is from God? Look, and this, this can happen in times where we are receiving like an abundant kind of blessing and it can happen when we are on the receiving end of something that is painful or has led us into suffering. And both of those, we can still miss the point. It's easy for us to miss the point when we've received some great blessing, that we receive something that can only come from God. It can only come from God. And we could somehow find a way to take credit for it, to think that, okay, well, I just said the right thing or I did the right thing or I've done the right thing over a long period of time. And so therefore this is me getting what I deserve. That's missing the point. Or even as we experience pain or suffering, it's easy for us to think that this is all on God and that I've done nothing to deserve this or I've done nothing to, to experience this kind of, of problem or this kind of pain. And we're missing how God is using these events or opportunities that move us into a deeper level of falling. This is what these people were doing. And, and I will say this is hard. Like it's hard to, to know and see what God is doing in our lives when he's doing it. Like think about you as a child, like as a kid, when your parents were doing something or withholding something from you or making you do something that you absolutely hated. Everyone in here probably has that experience in some way, shape or form, right? And, and you, didn't, you don't really understand what's taking place. You don't really understand what they're doing until you kind of look back and reflect on that, right? And then you have your own kids and then you have to have that awkward conversation where you go to your parents and you're like, man, you were right, right? No one likes that conversation but we have it. I, I can remember my parents not letting me play football like in elementary school. All my friends were playing football and I really wanted to play. And they didn't let me play because um, where we were, uh, the, we were only playing on Sundays, right? It was like when practice was, when games were, and so I wouldn't be able to go to church. And so I can remember just like being irritated with my parents about like, okay, I, I don't understand that. Like I want to play football. All my friends are playing football. Like you're making me go to church. That seems like the worst thing that you could do to me, right? 
But, but as I look back and as I reflect on that, like I kind of see what my parents were teaching me. They were trying to show me that like, look, something, if this is gonna be really held up, then you being there is really, really important. But at the time, like I didn't, I didn't like that idea. I didn't like that picture. The truth is like our lives are, are really good at making us blind to our spiritual needs. Like no matter where we are, right? So as a kid, you can kind of blame that your brain isn't fully developed and that's why you think those thoughts, right? I still try to use that, it doesn't work, right? But as we get adults, like it, it, life just changes and it's still, really, it's still really easy to miss what God's doing no matter what stage of life you're in, right? I have four, four kids, I'm trying to survive most of the time. Like let's just survive. Let's just let our kids live another day. Like let me live another day. And, and we all have different modes in which we operate in. But God is still bringing things into our lives, bringing in opportunities so that we might see them and have them move us into a deeper level of following. And, and the problem is, is that we have to be aware of that. And, and, and look, I would be lying to you if I said that every morning I wake up and I feel gratitude for what God has done in my life. I don't sometimes. I don't a lot of times. A lot of times I wake up and I think about how my life could be better. And, and what would have to change with my life to be better? Those are the things that sometimes I initially wake up and think about. Not, man, look at what God has done in my life. Look at what he's doing right now, right? And look how he's moving me into this deeper level of following. And as I follow him, I see him moving and, ch and changing and shaping my life for the better. He's doing that. But when I wake up in the morning, sometimes I'm like, God, like, why is my, why is my life not as good as it could be? Look, and we are more like this crowd than we like to admit. As we read through the story, we're like looking at the crowd and we're like, what the heck are these people thinking? Like, wh like what are they thinking? And then unfortunately we look at our own lives and we're like, okay, like this is basically me. That in one minute I I'm, I'm looking to, to, to make Jesus king and say, Jesus, you've got everything, man. You get my worship. I've, I'm seeing what you're doing and it's great. And like, I want to proclaim you as king. And in the next minute I'm like, Okay, God, like I need you to show up here. Like what's happening? Like, I feel like you're dropping the ball. Like you're not doing what I want you to do and my life isn't what I want it to be. What's going on? I think we're more spiritually schizophrenic than we would like to admit. Because at some point Jesus is trying to communicate to these people. Like I'm offering you more than just bread, like more than just literal bread. I'm offering you so much more than that. And for you and I, like it's, it's, it's Jesus offering so much more than the life that we think that we really, really want. Like Jesus is offering us much, much more than that. And, and we have to be crystal clear about, okay, what's happening in my life? What events or opportunities are, are, are being brought to me that are moving me into a deeper relationship with him? Because again, these things, they, they move us in, into a deeper level of following or like these individuals, it gave them the opportunity to hit the eject button. You see with Jesus, he's always gonna bring us to this singular point where we accept what he's given to us, we accept his message to us, we accept his, his, his words to us, or we reject and we hit it and we're out. We see this all over the place. And so the, 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 the crowd hits the eject button. The two quick things that I think you also see as we read through this. It's impossible for us, and we do this a lot, it's impossible for us to separate, you cannot separate belief and following. You cannot separate those because the crowd, they followed Jesus. And they followed him because of what Jesus gave to them. But in the end, th there was no belief there. Jesus points that out almost automatically. He says, you're following me, you see signs, you get food, but you do not believe. I, I think Nicodemus stands in contrast to this. Nicodemus interacts with Jesus. He believes Jesus. And that belief moved him to, into this place where he actually followed Jesus. We see in John chapter seven, Nicodemus stand up in the daylight, in front of his peers, in front of his superiors, and begins to communicate that the way that they are approaching Jesus and his ministry is backwards and wrong. He does it in front of an entire crowd in the daylight. You see, Jesus, Nicodemus' belief, it, it, it showed up in the way that he followed him. And Nicodemus isn't even literally following Jesus. He's following Jesus, he's looking, and he's believing in Jesus, and he's, and he's literally doing what God has placed in front of him to do. In John 19, um, after Jesus is killed and many of Jesus' disciples have fled, we see Nicodemus there. And he's there and he provides uh, the very expensive, lavish um, spices and embalming things that would be put on a body. It is Nicodemus who provides that in a very expensive, 
public, costly way. Not just costly financially, which it was, um, but costly for his reputation and who, he was, and who he was seen to be. So we see Nicodemus, there, there is no divorce between belief and following. And a lot of times we like to just sort of believe in Jesus. And I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. I believe that he, he brings some good things for my family, that he brings some good things to our culture, that he believes, I believe that he brings some good things to me. I believe that he is who he says he is, but I've got my own life and I'm trying to live it. And I'm trying to live it the way I want. See, like it doesn't make sense to divorce those two. Like belief and following, they, they cannot be separated. It's like in our marriage, like when, when, when love and action are separated, like we automatically know that there are problems there. Like when we say that we love him, but our actions don't follow through, like when love and action are, are, are separated, it's like huge, huge problems arise. We can go in seasons where that's the case. We can go in seasons where sometimes our words and our, and our deeds don't match up in our marriage. But after a while, like th- that causes significant issues. Or even just the idea of, of wanting all the benefits of marriage, but not the commitment. We see that a lot too. Like I, I, I want all the benefits of being with you, but I don't want to really be with only you. See, th- this is the message. This is what we see. This is what we do when we kind of want to separate the idea of belief and actually following. That one necessitates the other. You can't separate them. And so for the, for the crowd, it was... We, we, we follow you and we want more. We want more. We want you to show us more and give us more. But for Nicodemus, it was, I believe you and I'm going to follow you. And you're going to see that throughout the rest of my life. Last one is, is following Jesus is not a timestamp. Um, it's a process. So, so the action of, of, of walking with God, deciding to make that call is, is, a, is a decision that we make one time, but it's not like life is over, right? God is constantly unearthing things in us. He is constantly unearthing cracks in our foundation or things that pop up or things that, that we draw near. Um, and we see this in, in Nicodemus's life. Nicodemus's life was a journey, something that led him over a period of time. The disciples' lives were a journey. And even when they decided to follow and believe Jesus, there were still things that Jesus was working with them on. And so there's still things that God is working with you on. And so even, I don't know where you're at in your walk. Like maybe, you've, maybe you've, you accepted Christ as a kid, right? And, 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 and you think that, okay, well, now it's just like, I'm done. No, God is continually working on these things. That following him is this process. And again, marriage is a good picture here too. Like your life isn't over when you say the vows, right? Unlike what your unmarried buddies tell you, Right? Your life isn't over. Like it just starts. Like the process begins and you're constantly working on it because you know that and you find, you find there's a greater purpose there. There's a, there's a further purpose there than you had before. And there's greater significance there than you ever had before. And you sense that, you know that, and you experience that. And this is true for, for the believer. And, and so maybe, you, maybe you're here and I mean, you're, you're back because you've had kids and you're looking at your kids. Maybe you, you left church a long time ago based on past experiences. Maybe you left church a long time ago because, um, you know, you don't like Christian people and that you, there was some hypocrisy there. And so you left church, but you've had kids and you've come back, right? Because you're looking at your kids, you're like, these kids need Jesus. And so I got to get them to church. Maybe that's your story. Well, the good thing is, is that, man, Jesus, Jesus is, his, his, he is constantly inviting us. He's constantly inviting us, even when we do the wrong thing, even when we make the wrong decision, even when we're brought to the moment where we're like, okay, Jesus or this thing, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with my career or, or I'm going to go with this thing that I really want or I'm going to go with the things that I feel or the life that I want that I don't think these, these things can coexist. I'm going to go with this thing. You see, Jesus doesn't just renege and say, okay, well, offers off the table. He's constantly inviting us because following him is a process. It is a lifelong process. Even if you believe and follow him and walk with him for years and years and years, God is constantly unearthing things in us that crawl back up, that pop back up, that move back into our lives, that based on our situation, man, life changes. Like we have kids, man, and the things that we, things that we were concerned about change. Things that we prayed for change. The things that stress us out completely change. And now all of a sudden we are, we are at this new place where it's like, okay, I need God in this area and I didn't need him in this area before. This is how God 
works in our heart and works in our lives, and it never, ever ends. And so no matter where you are, you have things to do. And no matter who you are, God is constantly offering the invitation. We see this uh, in Luke, Luke 9. And this is very, in, a, in a very similar place as, the, uh, as the, the chapter 6 in John. And it says, If anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. This passage is incredible for a lot of reasons, but I want to focus on just like the very front part. This is that he says this to all the people. He said, for anyone, anyone to follow me. And this is coming from Jesus, who is God and would know exactly the level of dedication and commitment of everyone who is hearing that. And he knows that to us as well. And he invites us as well, knowing where we stand, knowing where we are on the spectrum of following. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly the issues that are preventing you from actually making and saying yes to him. He knows it all. And he's still saying, if anyone, anyone wants to follow me, this is what you have to do. And that's good news for us. It's a hard thing to read. It's a hard thing to accept. And it's a hard thing to say yes to. But it's a good thing that he is going to constantly invite us to that. And so, so maybe, maybe some prayers out of this for you would be, okay, one, like I, I want God to reveal some foundational pieces that are missing for me. Some pieces that, that, are, that make my following of him incomplete that I need to work on and I need to ask for, for help with. You know, or, or maybe it's that, God, you would reveal to me the, the things that I'm missing, the, the events that are happening across the spectrum of my life that are, that are meant to draw me close to you, that I am missing. Help me see those for what they really are. That I might believe and follow you. That I might not just keep you as a, at a distance, as, as an admirer, but I would embrace you as King and Lord of my life. Let's pray together. Father, I, th I thank you for who you are. I thank you, God, that you are a God of grace and that even as I stand here, I stand here as a person who is incomplete, as a person who um, has foundational things missing, Father, that, um, that you reveal, you point out, God, and that you give me a chance to, to grasp and embrace a better truth and a better reality. So Father, help us to continue to ask for those things, to desire for those things to be made known. God, so that we might work on, on the things that need to be dealt with, Father, that you would help us deal with that, God, and that our belief in you would spur us to follow you more and more. God, that we would begin to see the events in our life, God, as, as things that you're popping up and things that you're doing um, that are supposed to draw us to you, God, whether that's blessing, provision, or pain, Father, that we would see those things as, as you working in our lives, doing something behind the scenes that we cannot see. Father, that we would uh, trust in you and trust God that you have a process that you're walking with us in God and calling us to something greater. So we ask that in Jesus' name.